But uh, I'm glad you guys are here tonight. Uh, I'm looking forward to diving some more into Daniel with you. But first, I thought I'd start with a story. So uh, a little known fact here, ooh, a little known fact about me uh, is that when I was growing up, I was part of the Boy Scouts. And I have a picture for you to see of me. This is ninth grade Johnny. I'm at Boy Scout camp. I had long hair. And yeah, there it is. So uh, some of you, uh, you know, may be thinking to your he- yourself right now, like, uh, Johnny, you are a dweeb. Like, I have lost all respect for you right now. Others of you may not care at all, and some of you uh, may be really excited to find out I'm a Boy Scout, and I guarantee that those are the people that are also Boy Scouts in this room. So uh, the thing about Boy Scouts for me is that it was a pretty good experience. I, I enjoyed it, and uh, it actually taught me a lot of stuff. It taught me my love for the outdoors and camping and hiking and stuff like that, which are things that I still really enjoy to this day. Uh, but um, it also really helped to shape me as a leader. It was my first experience and opportunities to be able to lead growing up. And so, uh, you know, as, as a young scout, um, I was in the Boy Scouts, and some of you may be totally unfamiliar with what Boy Scouts actually do. You know, uh, so, uh, so there's all sorts of different stuff we do. So Boy Scouts are in a group that is called a troop and uh, they, it's a bunch of local students who are part of the same troop together. It's like ages like, I think like 11 maybe to 18. And so you get together and every week you have a meeting together. Um, uh, my troop every month, we had a camp out together. And then like once a summer, uh, you went to like a special summer camp together. This is where this picture's at. Uh, and then Every, like, like, maybe two or three times your entire time that you're in the Boy Scouts, you get to go on these special trips uh, called high adventure trips, and you, like, go to special places and do really cool things. So, uh, but um, one of the other big elements of it, again, is teaching people, teaching young people how to be leaders. And so while you're going through all of these different activities and doing all this different stuff, they give you different roles and positions to serve in and have you try out these different things. So I started off, uh, I think right here in this picture, I am the librarian. You can see my little librarian patch on my shoulder with some books on it. And literally all that meant was that if we ever needed our like troops tote of books, I was the guy that had to go grab the tote of books and bring it to wherever it needed to be. There wasn't much to it. But uh, I did other positions, like uh, at one point I was something called a scribe, where I had to take notes whenever we had a meeting and email them out to people. That was kind of annoying. But uh, I remember as a young scout, I remember thinking to myself, you know, um, the, the older scouts that are in the like, higher up leadership positions, they have a whole lot of influence on what is going on here. And At times, I would be frustrated with the things that were going on, and I would think to myself, is this really the best experience that they can create, or are they just benefiting themselves here? And so I remember being very passionate about it. I wanted to try and work my way up through all these different roles and positions until I could be like the head honcho Boy Scout. They call it the senior patrol leader. And I wanted to be that guy because I wanted to be able to influence what was going on. I wanted to give people the best opportunity that they could have, the best experience that they could have. And so I did just that. Like I said, I worked through all these different positions. I did all these different things. uh, And eventually, I became the senior patrol leader. But somewhere along the way, in the process of getting to that position, my attitude towards it had changed. Instead of being motivated by serving others and giving others the best experience, by the time I'd actually gotten this position, I was more concerned about the title and the authority that I had been given. I was more concerned about being able to benefit myself than I was benefiting others. I had uh, been lost in all of uh, my pride thinking that, you know, I deserve this position now. I should be the the senior patrol leader. I should be this head Boy Scout. And so uh, I had lost my original motivation to become this position in the first place because I had become prideful in the process of getting there. And so eventually, uh, you know, I got distracted by different things that were going on in my life. 
Uh, by the time that I had become that position, I was like 16, 17, and uh, I was involved in a lot of things at school. I was part of the choir and the band, and we had lots of different rehearsals and stuff like that. I was uh, on different sports teams, and I had a job and a girlfriend, and Boy Scouts was kind of my last priority at that point because I was more concerned about these new, exciting things that I was doing. And so again, I wasn't serving others, I was serving myself. I was, I was proud of this title that I had, but I wasn't actually doing anything with it. And so the adult leaders in my troop eventually told me that they were going to let me go, that I wasn't going to be the, the senior patrol leader anymore. They were dismissing me from my position because I wasn't really doing anything with it. And just like I am now noticing that I was just serving myself, that's what they saw in me. But at the time, I was so frustrated about it. I was just angry, and I, I can remember that I was, I was blaming them, and I, how could you do this to me? I deserve this position. I should be in this position. How could you possibly take this from me? Yet, uh, again, my pride ruined what could have been a really good thing. I wasn't serving others, I was serving myself. It was all about my pride and all about me. And so maybe you have a somewhat similar story. Maybe you've been in a leadership position and your pride has gotten the best of you. And maybe you don't. Maybe you haven't been in a leadership position yet. But the reality is that each and every person in here and each and every person in the world has to wrestle with their pride, has to deal with the fact that inside more often than not, we are motivated by benefiting ourselves instead of benefiting others. And so that's exactly what we're going to be digging into here tonight. We're going to be looking at, uh, back at Daniel again. We're going to be looking at chapters 4 and 5, which are some stories that we'll be learning about the pride of kings and the pride of kingdoms. So we've been going through this series uh, for the last several weeks, Kings and Kingdoms. And uh, we're going through and working through this uh, book of Daniel in the Old Testament. And so, uh, so far, you can see that we have looked at all these different chapters. You can see the numbers in each box there. We've looked at uh, chapter 1, which uh, was where Daniel and his friends are, are exiled to live in a foreign land called Babylon. And they are put into this uh, position where they have an opportunity to lead. And uh, Daniel and his friends, you guys might remember, uh, were offered to eat this luxurious food from the king's table, but instead chose to eat just the vegetables, right? And so then uh, Alex has been leading us through this book. After chapter 1, he told us about how we see these parallel chapters, how the chapters are teaching two different stories at two different points in the book, but they're teaching the same exact lesson. Right, so chapters 2 and 7 you can see are next to each other, which are the stories of the king's dream where he saw this statue that was made of many different metals. And the chapter 7 where he has the dream of, of the, the beasts, the four beasts. And uh, these visions or these dreams were used to reveal that uh, human kingdoms are temporary, but God's kingdom is not. God's kingdom lasts forever. So we see these two stories teaching one lesson. And so then uh, a couple weeks ago, the last time we met, Alex went through uh, chapters 3 and 6 with us. And these are the famous stories that you're probably familiar with from Daniel, where Daniel's uh, friends, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refuse to bow down to the golden statue. And so King Nebuchadnezzar throws them into a fiery furnace and tries to burn them to death. Uh, and then chapter 6, where Daniel keeps praying to God, uh, disobeying a law of the land, and he gets thrown into a lion's den, right? And so these chapters uh, are two different stories that, again, teach us one lesson. And that lesson is that God never abandons his people, and he will deliver them from their suffering, right? So we see these parallel stories that are totally different stories teaching one lesson, now, our final parallel chapters is what we're looking at tonight, which is chapters 4 and 5. So again, we're looking at two different stories that are teaching one lesson, and it's going to be talking about prideful kings and kingdoms. So we have two stories that we're going to be looking at. The first one we're going to call uh, Nebuchadnezzar's humiliation, and the second one we're going to call the handwriting on the wall. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar's humiliation, we'll start there. So at this point in Daniel, where we are at right now, we have established a couple things about the characters. 
So first of all, Daniel. We have established that Daniel has a supernatural ability to be able to hear dreams or visions and be able to accurately interpret what those dreams or visions mean. Okay? So Daniel has this supernatural ability to interpret dreams accurately. Remember, this has already happened once with uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream about the statue of many metals, and Daniel has interpreted that for him. So it's been established at this point in the story that Daniel can do this. So uh, we've learned that about Daniel, and then we've also learned about King Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of the Babylonian Empire, where this story takes place. So we've established that King Nebuchadnezzar is wildly prideful. Right? He, he made a giant statue out of gold of himself for people to worship. Right? That, that takes some pretty wild pride. This guy doesn't just view himself as a king. He doesn't just view himself as an emperor, but he views himself as deity. He views himself as a god, and he wants people to worship him. And so, uh, so much so, he believes this so wholeheartedly that when uh, Daniel's friends refused to do that, he threw them into a furnace and tried to burn them to death, right? He, he is, uh, no joke, believes that he is a god. So Nebuchadnezzar is wildly prideful, and Daniel can interpret de- dreams, and that is going to be very critical to our stories today. So the, the first one about Nebuchadnezzar's humiliation. So Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. He has another crazy dream, and I want to help describe it to you because it's pretty long, uh, and so I'm going to summarize it for you and describe it for you. So I'd like for you to just go ahead and close your eyes. Close your eyes, and I'm going to describe this dream for you, and I wanna, want you to try and picture it in your mind. So uh, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he has a dream about a tree. So I want you to see a tree in your mind and think about this tree. And this isn't just any tree, right? This, This tree is the biggest tree that you have ever seen, right? This thing is massive. It is huge. It is tall. It is healthy. It reached up into the sky so that the top of the tree is covered by the clouds, Right? The, um, no matter where you're at on earth, you can see this tree because of how big it is. It is visible from anywhere. The uh, fruit that is produced from this giant tree is enough to feed whoever comes to it and, and make them filled. Uh, it, its shade is so um, widespread that any animal can come and sit in protection under this shade from the hot sun. The, the birds of the sky can all fit inside of this tree. This thing is massive, right? And all of a sudden, you see this tree, and you then fu- suddenly see an, an angel coming down from the sky, right? And as it's descending, you hear it command that this tree be chopped down, right? And so uh, it's not only going to be chopped down, but uh, once it's finished, they want all of the branches to be lopped off of the uh, trunk. It wants all the leaves plucked off of it so that there's nothing left but the stump. And so you can see the axe coming down on the tree and hitting it over and over again until finally this massive tree has been cut and it starts to fall down. And as it uh, comes down to the ground, the earth is shaking because of this massive thing that is falling upon it. And so finally you see just the stump is left. That's all that's left from this massive, beautiful, healthy tree is a stump. And the angel says to bind up that stump with iron and bronze, to cover it in metal so that it can't be moved, and it's, uh, that it's going to stay here in the wilderness with all the animals and the birds until, it says in Daniel 4.15, the living may know that the most high rules the kingdom of men, and gives it to whom he will. All right, so go ahead and open your eyes. So this is this dream that that Nebuchadnezzar has, uh, and it's a weird dream, right? A tree and an angel and chopping down the tree, and then you just have the stump. And so rightly so, Nebuchadnezzar is a little confused. He doesn't really understand what this means or why he's having this dream. And so, again, Daniel has been established as someone who can accurately interpret dreams. And so he calls upon Daniel. He says, Daniel, please come. Uh, tell me what's going on in my dream. Why am I having this dream? So Daniel explains to King Nebuchadnezzar that 
the tree in this dream represents King Nebuchadnezzar himself, that the tree is King Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom and his uh, dominion and his greatness have grown over time, and uh, his authority is known all over the world, right? Just like how this tree is massive, and it's, uh, it's huge, and it's, it's visible from all over the place, King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom is the same. But that... Uh, when the tree is chopped down, this represents something that is going to happen to King Nebuchadnezzar. That when the tree is chopped down, this is uh, pointing to when King Nebuchadnezzar is going to be driven mad. He's going to go literally insane to the point where he is going to go out into the wilderness and live like a wild animal. Right? He's going to be like a, li- a wild animal living out in the wilderness. And it, uh, he says that it's until... And this is the key point. The purpose of why this is happening to him is, is until he realizes that God, the Most High, rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. That God is in charge, not King Nebuchadnezzar. That's the whole point of all of this. And so uh, we see here in Daniel, we're going to read a little bit about how King Nebuchadnezzar responds and how this goes down. So we'll go into verse 27 here where Daniel warns King Nebuchadnezzar about what to do. He says, Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may be perhaps a lengthening of your prosperity. So Daniel warns Nebuchadnezzar, you need to change your ways or this is coming soon. You don't want this to happen, so you better get your act together, right? So he warns the king. He's straight up with them. You need to get stuff together. You need to change your ways. And so we see how King Nebuchadnezzar responds in verse 28. Let's pull it up. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, so a year later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, and the king answered and said, Is this not great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? So you can see King Nebuchadnezzar's pride has not changed even a little bit with Daniel's warning here. He's focusing on how he's done this, how it's for his good, how for his glory that he is the one that built this incredible empire. And so finally, we see the prediction come true here in verse 31. While the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox, and seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Keep going. Immediately, the words were fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers and his nails were like bird's claws. So Nebuchadnezzar is out in the wilderness living like a wild animal for a long time. He's gone completely insane. He thinks that he is a wild animal and he is living like it. Uh, And so... The next time we read here, the next verse, as we jump into verse 34, it's going to show us uh, what Nebuchadnezzar's response to all this is. So everything that Daniel has predicted has come true, and it's happening to Nebuchadnezzar. Now let's see how he responds to this going mad. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High. And praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, and my majesty and my splendor returned to me. 
My counselors and my Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. So uh, everything that Daniel predicted came true, right? This horrible, traumatic experience happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. He's gone mad. He thinks he's a wild animal. He's lived in the wilderness for a very long time. And when he finally comes to his senses, he's not angry. He's not confused. He's not delirious. Instead, he's filled with clarity and he praises God. He recognizes that he is not in control. God is, and he honors him for it, right? And God blesses him for his humility. He gives him back his kingdom. He gives him back his glory and his majesty, all, everything that he had and more, right? God gives him back and blesses him for his humility. So we see this story here, and it ends just like that. That's the end of chapter 4, and it moves into this next story. But there's some time that has passed here between the first story in chapter 4 and now the handwriting and wall in chapter 5. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 5 is no longer the king over Babylon. In fact, it's a, a few kings later, right? Uh, this uh, is now a ruler named Belshazzar. Right? And, and uh, from what we can tell, the research that I did, Belshazzar is actually not the proper king of the Babylonian Empire. He's actually the son of the king of the Babylonian Empire. And so he's not properly a king. Uh, his, his father is, is handling some, some pressing business at this time, right? Babylonian Empire is being threatened by war. There's invading uh, empires that are coming and, and endangering uh, the Babylonian Empire, they're threatening to come in and take over the land, to take over the government, and take over their people. And so the, the king is off trying to handle that, presumably. He's, he's either out handling discussions, or he's been captured, or he's been killed. But either way, the, the proper king is not in his throne. He's not here in the story. And so Belshazzar is instead ruling in his place. But Belshazzar, regardless of this temporary position, regardless of it just happening by chance... He is incredibly prideful about his position. He's the king, and he is taking full advantage of it, right? So all of this stuff is going on, this horrible impending war that is threatening his country and it's threatening his empire, and rather than preparing for war, rather than trying to handle some, um, some deliberation with the other empire, rather than trying to uh, encourage his people and tell them that they can, uh, they'll be safe and, and, and trying to make them stay calm, he throws a party and he gets drunk, right? This king is so full of himself that he is not trying to benefit anyone but himself, He's not trying to comfort his people. He's not trying to care for his people. He is only trying to make himself happy, right? So uh, during this party, all of a sudden, a hand appears out of thin air. No body attached to it, just a hand. And this hand starts writing on the wall. And it writes these words that mean numbered, numbered, weighed, and divided. And again, Daniel is called to interpret what is going on here, to interpret why this hand wrote these words. Uh, the interesting thing about Daniel's interpretation here is that he doesn't start by jumping right into the interpretation. He starts by retelling the story of Nebuchadnezzar going mad and living in the wilderness. And he's trying to point out to Belshazzar, look at the pride of the kings before you. Look at how prideful they were, but when they humbled themselves and when they acknowledged that God is the true authority, that is when they were blessed. So will you humble yourself or will you be prideful? So we look at chapter 5, verse 22 for Daniel's warning and how the king is going to respond to his request. And you, his son, Belshazzar, or you, his predecessor, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart. Though you knew all of this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven 
and the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. And you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath, and whose are all your ways you have not honored. You keep going. This, then the, from his presence the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed. Mene, Mene, Tekel, and Parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So uh, in this story, Belshazzar responded to his pride very differently from King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was humbled by his experience, by going mad and living like a wild animal, but then we have Belshazzar, who instead of humbling himself and caring for his people and, and repenting of what he had done, chooses to just focus more on the things that he has and the authority that he has. He, he makes Daniel a ruler in the kingdom. He clothes him in a, a purple robe. He gives him a golden chain. His focus is only on his treasures, his wealth, his power, and his authority, not on being able to humble himself and care for his people. And it, his pride led him to his death and led him to losing everything. His empire has now been taken over by a new uh, empire. His people are now forced to live under a new government. His people are now uh, uh, forced to, to live in a different way from what they're used to, and he didn't care for them at all. He lived in his pride, and he never changed his ways. So uh, between these two chapters, we see a whole lot of similarities, but I want to point out two of them to you. The first similarity is that both kings are proud. Both kings are proud. They, they uh, are vain. They focus on themselves. They're so self-centered that they only are thinking about how they can serve themselves and lift themselves up. They use their authority for their own benefit. But the other similarity is that in both chapters, Daniel calls out their pride. He, he points both kings to their sin, and he points them to humility and repentance. Daniel points them to humility and repentance. But the big key difference in these two chapters is how they responded to Daniel pointing to humility and repentance. See, for the response of each king was different. Nebuchadnezzar finally humbled himself. He finally acknowledged that glory belongs to God and God alone. He acknowledged that he is not the ultimate authority, but God is. But Belshazzar, he refused, and it led to his death. You know, it reminds me of this key theme that we see throughout Scripture, this, this theme that recurs throughout many books of the Bible, and we see it very clearly stated in James 4, 6, and it says this, that God opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God is, is against pride. God is, is other than pride. He, he is for humility, and he blesses humility, but pride is just going to lead to him putting people into humbling situations. Now, there's, there's some realities about pride, and as I said, every single person in this room, every single person in our world is wrestling with pride. We all have to deal with our selfish motivations, using our own uh, authority, using our own power and title and position to be able to benefit ourselves, and we have to wrestle with that. See, pride corrupts all of our leaders. It's just a reality that all of our leaders are corrupted by pride. It, it's true of whether it's a king or a president or uh, whatever sort of government that you're, you're t uh, watching, they, they are corrupted by pride. But it's not just political figures. It's, it's our teachers, our parents, our coaches, even our pastors are corrupted by pride too. 
All of our leaders are corrupted by pride, and we have to uh, recognize that. And the reason that all of our leaders are corrupted by pride is because all of us are corrupted by pride. Pride corrupts all of us, too. It's easy to point the finger at, at people that are, are uh, in power and position and stare at their flaws and mistakes, but when the reality is that we are just as prideful as they are. We just don't have the position or the circumstances to expose the ugliness of our pride. But the hopeful thing that the Bible gives to us is that while pride corrupts all of our leaders, it corrupts all of us, the hope is that one day it won't. The Bible gives us hope that one day there'll be a world where pride isn't corrupting it. Pride isn't motivating everything that we do. Instead, we have Jesus who is not filled with pride, but he's filled with humility. He's the only one that deserves all of our honor and praise. He's majestic. He's powerful. He is deserving of every bit of praise and glory that we can give. Yet when he was on earth, he didn't come with pomp and circumstance. He didn't come with trumpet fanfare. He didn't come with armies and royal courts following him. Instead, Jesus was a humble servant. Christ's life showed us that true leadership is not a display of our glory. It's not a display of our power, but instead, true leadership is a display of our humility, our service, our compassion, and our love. That's what true leadership is. So as we think about these chapters, I want to challenge us a little bit to think about what uh, it means for us. What it means for us to be able to live humbly. What does that look like? If we, if we aren't careful... We are all going to get distracted by our pride in the process of getting through our lives. See, all of you are one day going to be put in uh, positions with power and authority. And how you deal with your pride right now as a high school student will impact how you use your position, how you use your authority in the future. So I encourage you to learn how to live humbly now. It's things like these, like thinking of ways to benefit others above yourselves, always acting in love, pursuing justice and peace when you see oppression and injustice, giving to those in need, seeking to be more like Jesus, and thanking God for everything that you have because you realize that it is not something you've earned, it's not something you've done for yourself, but instead, these are all things that God has given to you. So doing these things not only protect us from being the prideful leaders of the future, but they also give others a glimpse into the non-prideful, non-corrupt kingdom of God that we hope will come one day. We look forward to it coming one day, this, uh, this kingdom of humility, this kingdom of love where God rules in his deserved glory, in his deserved authority. We look forward to that day. So as we finish up right now, as I uh, move back into worship here, I want you to think about one question. I want you to think, what is one thing that you can be doing to live this out? What is one way that you can live in humility over the next 24 hours? How can you, in the next day, choose to be living humbly? How can you start practicing living out humility right now? So let me uh, pray for you guys and ask God for his help with that, and then we'll take some time to worship. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to be able to dive into your word this evening and take a look and thinking about our pride. See, the reality is uh, that if we are being honest with you, if we're being honest with ourselves, that each and every one of us are proud people. We, we want to benefit ourselves more than we want to benefit others more times than not. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us to recognize that first and foremost. Help us to, to expose ourselves as proud people and then learn how to live humbly instead. Lord, help us to find practical ways to start living this out. Help us to start living humbly in this moment now, whether we have authority and position and power to benefit ourselves at this moment or not, that we'll live humbly now so that when we get to those points, we won't lean into our pride, but instead we'll lean into you. We'll lean into a lifestyle of humility, a lifestyle of service, compassion, and love. We ask for your help in this in the name of Jesus.